I'm sorry, folks. I just absolutely had to have a cigarette. Uh, okay. There is something like this in your brain that takes sets of symbols and translates them into other symbols. Or takes information in one form and turns it into information in another form. Lots of things in your brain that do this. Every part of your brain can be modeled this way. And if Searle wants to say okay, that he can represent the brain with this kind of model, he's got a lot more work to do. The Chinese room is only one, only represents a small part of your brain capacity, a small part of what the brain does, a small part of the information processing machinery that could be established in a computer. So to make something that was a mind the way your mind is, you had to make things like this and other things to do the other things the brain does. This is just too simple a model. Semantics is accomplished by other parts of the brain. It's accomplished in the parts that deal with feelings, um, with impulses, volitions, with what you do, what you would have to do if, certain, if circumstances changed. Okay, it's making sense? Okay. All right. Okay, now, another objection. Philosophers make up for something that we all experience, but we never really talk about. We don't even notice. It's so fundamental, we don't notice it. Um, have you ever walked around something without noticing that you're walking around it? It seems kind of weird to think about it, but say you're Um, so you're talking to a friend. You're on, a, you're on your Bluetooth. You're talking to a friend. You're walking down the corridor. You go like this. And then uh, a couple of seconds later, you say, you say to yourself, what did I just dodge? What did I just dodge around? Because your attention's on your conversation, right? Your body's pretty much on automatic pilot. Well, if that example is plausible, if that example is plausible, what happened then was that you noticed something subliminally. You noticed something but didn't, your brain noticed something, but you didn't bring it into consciousness. So it was a mental operation, but an unconscious one. You did all the things to dodge around the person. You were, um, have you ever arrived home with no memory of driving there? Because you're thinking about something else, right? And you just, I mean, you're paying attention to the road, but it's not making it into consciousness. It's stored. Your body, your brain can drive without you paying attention in a, in a certain way. But that stuff, it's like, so, so you ask yourself, what did you dodge? And you look back, and it's a clown. And you've been so interest in, interested in your conversation, you just had not noticed that it's a cloud. Just something in your way you dodge around. Now, if that's plausible, there's a difference between processing information and feeling it and seeing it, right? You know, you saw it there in the sense that you didn't have to touch it to go around, right? Your, your eyes registered it and passed the information there. But 
the big red nose, the green fright wig, um, the, the, the polka dot bloomers, right? None of that penetrated. You ever had experience of seeing something or knowing something's there, but not really having the sense of its color or its texture, like missing details? You can set up a device that if you point it at this red pen cap, it will register the color. It will register this as different from this. It can be set up to say that this is red, this is blue, this is purple, this is green. But the device will never experience color the way you do. You have color experiences, right? So knowing that this is red is different from experiencing it as red. That's the qualia, the redness of it, the, the, how it looks to you. And Nagel says, machines can't do qualia. And Young says, why the hell not? Oops. qualia. How do they do it? They do it by processing information. Red light and green light and blue light, the light registers different on your eye and the eye sends different signals. There's a different pattern of synaptic firings. On off, on off, on off, on off, on off, on off. Right? There's a different pattern of synaptic firings for each color. I don't see any reason why the brain can't do qualia, right? Why process inflation? That's how the brain does it. If the brain does qualia in a different way from processing information the way a computer can, tell me what that way is. Functionalism implies that if you make a machine that processes information exactly the way your brains process information. And that machine is hooked up to instruments that can provide color information in exactly the same way color information is presented to you. The mind in the machine will see color the way you do. Now in the last 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about David Chalmers, who's given what I think is, is a very strong contender for the dumbest, dumbest, dumbest argument ever in philosophy. so-called philosophical zombie.
imagine a zombie, uh, uh, a being that's just like a person, just like one of you, one of me, and this thing's brain does everything our brains do, absolutely everything. It's important to remember that the, the zombie's brain processes information exactly the way our brains process information. There is nothing lacking in the brain. However, it doesn't have consciousness. Because we can imagine this, Chalmers says, and I'm not saying this, Chalmers says, because we can imagine this, it follows that information processing is not what makes consciousness. Information processing is not what makes consciousness. Functionalism is false. beginning to see right off the bat why I, why I think that this is a strong contender for the dumbest argument ever in philosophy. Chalmers isn't trying to say that it's possible to have consciousness without information processing. He's just saying that we can imagine it. But he's also saying the mere fact that we can imagine this proves something. Plus two equals seven. Can you imagine that? Imagine you just take I take <coughs> take two pans, two pans, right? Put them together, put them together, and make seven. You can imagine that happening. I could animate it. We can imagine that. Imagine that you have a pickup truck and that is working perfectly. The engine is driving, the, 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 it's connected to the drivetrain, the wheels are turning, uh, they have proper traction, everything is in place to make it move, but it's not moving. We can imagine that, right? Because by Chalmers' logic, by this kind of logic, the fact that we can imagine this thing means that engines don't make trucks go. That it's not proved that engines make trucks grow. There's some doubt about whether the engine and the drivetrain and the wheels make the truck go. Because we can imagine them all working and it not going. This is Cotswallop. I mean, this is utter, utter, it's hard to think of a word that's appropriate that isn't obscene. And you look on Wikipedia, and there's an article, and this guy draws a paycheck for coming up with rubbish like this. Okay, 
I understand you're having more fun over there than the rest of the class has listening to me, but please don't write it in. Um, okay. So Chalmers' argument is just that, imagine this. Now, the reason I bring this up was partly to whine, complain that this guy has a full-time job and I don't. And it's partly to make fun of this. But it's also to point out that in philosophy, um, just as in every other realm of life, it's possible for people to come up with catastrophically stupid arguments, unimaginably bizarre arguments, that get taken seriously by large numbers of people. The weird thing to me, I mean, it, I'm not saying that he's done something wrong by coming up with this. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with people thinking it about a bit, but it just boggles the mind that anyone takes this seriously for more than five minutes at a time, that this could be considered a serious theory. And yet it is. He has a full-time job. And people don't point to him on the street and laugh. It just Anyway, okay, so this is the doctrine of functionalism. It follows directly from mind-brain identity theory. Um, there are some objections to uh, mind-brain identity theory and to functionalism. The only really serious one is John Searle's Chinese Room, and that one doesn't work. The others are completely ridiculous. So anyway, I'll see you all next week.